Today we're talking with computer engineering students at Iowa State University in Ames, Iowa. In the classroom, we have students from the Large Scale Tools for Data Analysis class taught by Dr. Shikanta Dirthapura. And speaking to the students, we have Neha Kochari, who is a data scientist at LinkedIn, and she's joining us from Mountain View, California. I'm a data scientist at LinkedIn, and I work with the growth team. Um, my day-to-day -day job is basically understanding LinkedIn's data and trying to either drive a business decision, um, come up with a new product feature, or um, an interesting story from LinkedIn's data. Maybe you can talk about some of the different technologies or tools uh, that you're using to, to get to this data. Primarily, I use uh, Hadoop to query the data, uh, basically to get from the data that LinkedIn tracks to the data sets that I'm interested in. Um, I also use SQL um, for certain types of data sets that are smaller. Uh, and then in order to analyze the information, sometimes if I'm building a model, I'll use something like R. Um, sometimes I'll use Excel. But uh, primarily, I would say a lot of my work is um, writing in PIG, which is one of the scripting languages for Hadoop, um, and then sometimes writing functions in, in other languages. Maybe you can talk about some of the, the challenges of using Hadoop and, and working with uh, these really large data sets. Yeah, so the first thing is just the challenge of getting from data that you have to data that you want. Even if you're collecting, in theory, a very large quantity of data, that doesn't mean that it's the actual information that you care about. To give you an example, um, you know, we track everything that people click on on LinkedIn. But if my question is whether um, people are dropping off in the registration flow because they don't understand a certain part of it, to answer that question from the information of what people are clicking on is quite a bit of work. So that's one challenge. Um, then particularly in working with Hadoop, the, the user interface for Hadoop is such that when there's a failure, I don't necessarily have a lot of information about logging of what the error is and uh, what, what's causing the problem. So a lot of uh, kind of debugging that I've done has been trial and error, but over time you sort of become familiar with what different things can go wrong. So that certainly improves um, as you get more familiar with your data sets as well as with the tools. In terms of algorithms, could you talk a little bit about what the most common things that you deal with are? Um, I'd imagine that you do a lot with graph operations, et cetera. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. So actually with R, um, it's, it's used kind of on an individual basis. So I wouldn't say that there are um, products at LinkedIn that necessarily we're, we're using R at scale. So just to give you an example, let's say I want to build a predictive model um, for the likelihood that someone is going to change jobs. So because of my experience with R, I might choose to use some of the built-in functions there. On the other hand, um, for more graph-based things, I think that um, there are a few visualization tools we use. For example, Gephi is one, uh, which allows you to basically kind of visualize different ways in which you could um, structure your graph. Uh, so for example, um, if you go to LinkedIn, there's something called InMaps, which basically if you have, I think, 70 or more LinkedIn connections, you can get this visualization of your graph. And basically, it's a force-directed graph that's going to cluster all of the people in your network based on, um, you know, what overlapping connections you have. So that visualization is something that was done through Gephi. Um, there are a lot of other uh, different tools that are used, but those are a couple examples that I'm familiar with. So you said you were using Hadoop. Um, so what type of cluster are you, are you running on, and um, who manages that? Is that someone on your team or someone in IT? And um, how does that affect your workflow? Um, I can tell you that uh, there is an entire Hadoop operations team which runs LinkedIn's Hadoop cluster, which is a very, very large cluster. Um, over the last two years, I know we've quadrupled in size in terms of our Hadoop cluster. Um, from time to time, they're making a lot of changes uh, in terms of, just to give you an example, we used to be able to run local instances of Hadoop on our machines. 
but now there are enough people using um, Hadoop and also because of kind of security concerns we can no longer do that so all of our Hadoop queries are running on the central LinkedIn cluster which obviously is much more secure um, but that's just an example of the types of changes that happen sort of even as you're scaling Hadoop. So are there things that are user facing that might run through your Hadoop and um, because it seems like if you need such a large system that it it would be something that the users are also running through is that correct? No, actually, this is all for internal use. And the reason that, um, if you think about, there are probably you know a couple thousand people at this point that are using Hadoop at LinkedIn, and that is running. That's for all of our um, offline jobs that do power online systems, as well as any kind of ad hoc work that uh, you might do. So, to give you an example, a recommendation product. product Product, such as jobs you may be interested on on LinkedIn uh, might be driven by basically an offline job that's running on a daily basis crunching through you know petabytes of data and so that's why that cluster has to be so large even though actually no um, LinkedIn members or have any interaction with it. The Hadoop that you use is it the same as the publicly available version or is it some tweaked Hadoop for LinkedIn? There's something called DataFoo, which is open sourced by LinkedIn. And what that has is actually a lot of the functions that we use on Hadoop. So aside from the cluster itself, I would say the thing that's most customized is um, kind of the, uh, the layer of functionality on top of that. The cluster itself, I can't go into detail about how it's customized for LinkedIn. I'm sure that there are ways in which it is. But it is, it is very much the same open source tool that's used by many other companies and individual users. Some packages on top of Hadoop have been released by LinkedIn as open source. Right, so DataFoo is the, the name of the set of functions, kind of the repository of LinkedIn functions. And there, there are other ones as well. Basically, these are the functions that we use um, in order to run some of the uh, modeling as well as the ad hoc work that we do on Hadoop. One other thing I can mention is we also have uh, a few people at LinkedIn, I believe, who are Apache contributors. So there is very much um, you know, overlap in what LinkedIn does and the development of the open source tool. What does that look like? Uh as a developer um, to say, you know, I wrote this and I think it would be great for DataFoo. How do you go about um, seeing if that's the right choice and then cleaning it up and releasing it? Uh, so uh, a lot of it just starts with people building things that are useful to themselves. So there's not a lot of process there, um, and that's by design. It's you know meant to be that anytime someone feels that they can build something that would be useful, they should go ahead and do it, and there shouldn't be a lot of like obstacles for that. Then at some point, if you feel that this is something that a lot of other people would find useful um, and you, you want to make it kind of more accessible or multi-purpose, then at that point, there's a review process um, that you can go through and that will basically you know, lead to this being published um, in, in an open source project. Another example of this is Kafka, which is a messaging, message queuing system that LinkedIn has open sourced. And very similarly, it started with a group within LinkedIn developing it because it was very useful for their particular application. And then um, because it scaled so well, they decided to sort of invest more effort into it, um, did some research, basically decided to turn it into a full-fledged open source tool. Uh, so it sounds like um, you're doing a sort of exploratory data mining sort of thing where you're looking for any sort of... Uh, data that would be useful to the business and getting more users to sign up. It's so like, what, is, what extent is it up to you to decide what to look for? Or you decide how to do that? Or? That's pretty much up to me. Um, it, it's kind of given whatever. I mean, it's one thing if I want there to be new types of data being created. That's something that would obviously require engineering changes um, and also more resources. So maybe management would be involved there. But terms of what data to look at that we're already collecting, it's entirely up to me. What would you say are some of the misconceptions maybe that people have about uh, you know, data science or what it means to be a data scientist? So uh, one thing I would say is 
Uh, a lot of the work is just building a data set. Um, it's actually not building a model. The modeling part usually is about, I don't know, 20% of the work that you do to solve a given problem. 80% of it is just getting to a data set. And a lot of that is, it's not a skill necessarily that aligns with any particular discipline. It's more just being curious and determined and fighting with various types of bugs. So, so I think there's a lot of um, there's a lot of art to it probably uh, that just is being familiar with the data sets that you work with and being able to extract the information you want out of them. And then there's also very you know interesting models that you can build on top of that, but also some very simple things, like being able to count things, for example, can create a lot of value uh, in different ways. So just, you know, how many members do we have? How many of them are showing up uh, on, on this particular page? And of the people who show up on a page, how many make it to the next page? That's a really simple question, but being able to answer that can sometimes um, lead to a pretty major insight. Uh, who are some of the different types of people that you work with in your role? On the data science team, there are people from a lot of different backgrounds, all generally kind of quantitative analytical backgrounds. Um, uh, my manager had a PhD in chemistry. Um, another person's background is genetics, statistics, economics. We have several physicists. So a uh, pretty broad range, um, but all kind of having some experience working with data in an applied setting and then trying to answer questions about real people um, using data. I think that wraps it up. Thank you for taking the time to come and speak with us. Yeah, thank you.